webinar is going to be polymers with biologically inspired autonomous functions. And um, this, the way I've structured the webinar um, is, um, oh, let me, let me actually just start out with some acknowledgments. Um, uh, I just want to mention, too, that the work that I'm going to present today is, is really highly collaborative. Um, it's part of work done at the, by the Autonomous Material Systems Group here at the Beckman Institute at the University of Illinois. So I'll give a shout out to my many collaborators, uh, Philippe Goubel in aerospace engineering, Scott White in aerospace engineering, Jeff Moore uh, in chemistry, and Paul Braun in material science. And Scott, Jeff, and Paul are all part of my uh, ICAM, uh, BP ICAM 11 project. I uh, also want to acknowledge uh, our BP mentor, Sai uh, Venkateswaran, uh, who's in uh, BP Houston. And of course, also special thanks to Chital and Bob uh, for helping organize this and, and all their efforts uh, in getting us going in the ICAM. Um, let me say a little bit about the webinar and how I decided to approach this. So what the, the first half of the um, webinar, what I plan to do is give an introduction, uh, talk in general about microcapsule-based autonomous polymers, um, and give one example of a, of a self-healing coating material. Um, all of this has been work that's um, been out in the literature for a little while, but I wanted to give everyone sort of an equal background to the types of things we do here at Illinois. Um, then in the second half of the webinar, what I'd like to, to focus on are some new functions um, we have um, developed using a microcapsule-based approach, in particular the autonomous damage indication. This is part of our ICAM 11 uh, project. And we'll be looking at using color change and fluorescence to indicate damage. And so that'll be, I'll focus on um, that work, which is just very newly published um, uh, for the second part, and then, and then summarize. So getting into the introduction, just by way of background, what are autonomous material systems? These are materials that are inspired by biological systems. So autonomy is the ability to function in an independent and automatic fashion. And as you can see on the screen, um, and I, I think I can use my pointer. Yeah, so I can use this a little bit. Um, the example we always point to is the uh, ability for biological systems to heal themselves when you have a, a cut or a wound. There is a complex healing response that, that goes on, but it occurs automatically. You know, and actually, there's a very rapid uh, clotting response first. It's very site-specific. And then that's followed by a longer-term reaction where the tissue um, actually reforms and, and heals um, until you're back to 100%. So the idea with autonomous material systems is to look at these, um, these biological functions and, and actually bring it into synthetic material systems. Right? So we want to create synthetic materials with biologically inspired functions like self-healing. But in addition to self-healing, we're looking at things like self-cooling and self-protection. Um, and these materials respond to the environment or environmental stimuli in an automatic and site-specific fashion without manual intervention. So that's really the whole goal, that all of this really occurs without any energy input. Uh, if you look across the literature and in our own work, um, there are really three strategies for autonomous uh, polymers or creating these kinds of functions in polymers. It, um, the first is embedded microcapsules, where you have uh, uh, small uh, core shell microcapsules embedded in the polymer. Uh, they've got good shelf life. They're easy to bring into a polymer or a coating or a paint. Um, the real disadvantage, though, is that once the capsules are open, they're essentially done with their, their function. Um, and the goal is to have enough capsules in there to, to extend the life sufficiently of, of, of whatever you're looking at. Um, the second approach over on the right is uh, we call it an intrinsic approach. This is really where um, you change the, the backbone of the polymer uh, to impart some sort of 
dynamic bonding, uh, which could involve reversible hydrogen bonding, ionic bonding, and in some cases even dynamic covalent bonding in, in more recent work. Um, it requires, in order for healing to occur or for a function to occur, you have to have intimate contact so this dynamic bonding can occur. Oftentimes, you, need, you also need mobility, so it might require some external energy like um, heat or uh, UV light. And it tends to, to work only in, in soft materials with low glass transition temperatures so that this, this bonding has the ability to occur on, on a reasonable time scale. Um, there is some work going on in, in our ICAM project on intrinsic materials. Uh, today I'm going to focus just on the microcapsules. And then, but, but rounding things out is the third approach, which is uh, microvascular networks. Vascular delivery is an interesting alternative to capsules because it's like embedding a circulatory network in the material. Um, it allows, allows continuous supply of healing agents or other types of chemicals. Um, it, it turns out it's easy to get these kind of networks into structural composites. Um, and really, this is the type of systems we're looking at for things like cooling um, or large-scale damage, regeneration, those types of functions. So um, also by way of introduction, introduction, I just wanted to talk a little bit about the types of damage and how you might select the appropriate healing system uh, or approach uh, to match the types of damage. And this is a schematic that just shows different damage modes that might occur in, in polymers and polymer matrix composites. Um, and you know, there's, there's lots of different damage that can occur, from delamination to impact damage to scratches and gouges. Um, and it, it spans um, very different length scales. And the, the length scale of the damage really is what kind of controls which approach you're going to look at. And so I'm using a fiber reinforced composite just to illustrate these length scales because they are so hierarchical and, and really experience damage on a range of length scales. They give a good, good example. But so you see a laminated composite there that has a, a pretty significant delamination up in the top. And it's you know on the order of millimeters. Um, if you wanted to try and heal this damage or protect from this damage, um, really what you need is a microvascular approach because you have to, you ha it's, you know, you're not going to get millimeters of new material into um, that laminated section. So you would choose a vascular approach. Um, if you look at a smaller length scale, though, um, for example, the microcracking that occurs between plies, like transply cracking, um, that's often due to residual stress or um, uh, in fatigue base loading, uh, that's a length scale in that sort of um, 10 to 100 micron length scale where microcapsules really um, are, are, have a lot of utility um, and are able to heal that type of damage well. Then if you look even smaller, down to say the the length scale of the fiber matrix where the opening of the damage is, is really quite small. It actually is, is close to a closed crack. Um, this is, these are cases where the capsule and the very, very small capsules would work as well as the intrinsic molecular approaches. So that's just a little overview of, of why you would choose a particular approach. Um, for the webinar today, I'm going to focus on uh, capsule-based uh, autonomous polymers. And you just see an image here of some very small capsules which have been decorated onto some glass fiber surfaces, just to show how um, uh, small they can be made as well. And I'll talk a little bit about how to make the capsules and, and some examples of recent healing work that we've done. Um, there are lots of different ways to make capsules. We actually put together a pretty nice review paper on encapsulation methods um, in 2011. That was a macromolecules article. So that's a good article you see down at the bottom if you're, if you're interested in the different techniques. Um, on the top is emulsification, and that's the primary method we use, where you form an oil water emulsion, and um, the, what you're going to encapsulate in the core is the oil. And the shell wall is, is out in the aqueous solution. Um, and it, it's a very effective way. There are other methods as well. 
There's uh, layer by layer assembly, uh, coacervation techniques, and internal phase separation techniques. And on the next slide, I've just kind of summarized the advantages and disadvantages of those different techniques. You can see the emulsification on the top. Really what this gives you are high strength, um, very stable shell, uh, a very stable shell wall. Um, you can synthesize capsules at large scale using this technique. Um, it's disadvantages though is it's, it's really hard to encapsulate by this method if the core uh, doesn't dissolve in water. If, it's, um, uh, if the core actually, sorry, if the core is miscible in water. So aqueous based cores are, are, are tricky. Not impossible, but just tricky. Um, then you also see the other techniques there, layer by layer assembly, uh, coacervation uh, and, and internal phase separation. So they each have a certain amount of advantages and disadvantages and depending really on, on the core material and how you want to trigger the capsule is how you choose your encapsulation method. So I'm, I'm just focusing on the encapsulation by emulsification um, which is the the primary method that, that we use and that I'll discuss uh, later on when I talk about uh, damage indication. Um, there, are, there are a number of ways to do this by emulsification. There are interfacial reactions uh, and then what I show here is a common in situ polymerization of urea and formaldehyde to, to form the shell wall. So in the schematic you see basically we form an emulsion by stirring um, and the core material is the oil phase so it doesn't dissolve um, in water um, and this might be a healing agent later on you'll see it's a damage indication uh, agent and then in the aqueous phase we have urea formaldehyde surfactants and then uh, when it's set to go basically this polymerizes in situ and you form a solid shell wall we control the diameter of the capsules primarily by the agitation rate the more shear you put in the system, the smaller the capsule diameter. So the capsules can really range from a few hundred microns, which are quite large, but then down to maybe say 10 or 20 microns, which is a, which is a nice size for, for many applications. Um, as, I, as I indicated earlier, it's also possible to make the capsules very small. So if you want to go sub 10 microns, just continuing to stir really isn't the, the most efficient way to do it. You have to put a little more energy in the system. So you need to either use a homogenizer or sonication. Uh, and that's what is able to bring the capsules down to basically a, a, a one micron type of size scale. And you can get a lot of small capsules there. If you want to push below a one micron size scale, you have to actually stabilize the core a little bit because the core tends to swell due to Ostwald ripening. So smaller than one micron requires a chemical stabilization so um, with an ultra hydrophobe which means you actually have to replace part of the core you want to encapsulate with um, this ultra hydrophobe. In this case I show the effect of putting hexadecane in. That's a very common one in encapsulations. But with say about five uh, weight percent of the core being hexadecane it stabilizes this into very small droplets when you sonicate or homogenize and you can get down to capsules in the nanometer size scale range and I just show some SEM and TEM Im images of our of core shell microcapsules that are just about 200 little over 200 nanometers in diameter so they do have still have a nice core shell uh, morphology there's just not a lot of volume inside of these capsules but they they're um, and interesting, um, they show the range of possibilities with encapsulation. And on this slide, just to, to kind of give, when you, when you embed these capsules in uh, a polymer matrix, even uh, across many length scales, it's very, if you uh, tailor the adhesion correctly, you will be able to rupture the capsules um, mechanically due to the crack impinging on them. And also, if you look at these different fracture surfaces, so these are all SEM fracture surfaces of capsules ruptured in an epoxy matrix. Um, the fracture surface has been tilted a little so you can see inside the capsule. 
what you can see are evidence of toughening mechanisms, so crack pinning um, and crack deflection. And those are all really important toughening mechanisms for polymers. And it, it says it's something important about capsules, and one of the advantages of them is that adding the capsules actually improves many of the properties of the polymer. In particular, it increases the fracture toughness significantly. And so that's a nice advantage, is that you're not making the polymer weaker by adding um, this filler, this addition of capsules. So there are several combinations of capsules that you can use to achieve um, a given function. In particular, we've been focusing on, on healing. And this slide just summarizes the different possibilities of capsule combinations um, that you could use. And we've, we've really demonstrated healing with um, all of the different systems you see here. But I'll go through them. Uh, the first system that you see in the upper uh, left is a single capsule system where the capsules would contain a polymerizing agent like a monomer. And in our first, our very first demonstration of healing, that, that monomer was uh, dicyclopenadiene. Um, and then it also requires a second phase, something that's going to polymerize what's in the capsule, a catalyst. The catalyst is um, just uh, in its solid form and dispersed throughout the matrix here, it could also be encapsulated in something like wax to protect it. It actually gives even better results. But the idea is that the capsule, the monomer in the capsule, is released when it's ruptured, it interacts with the catalyst, and you form a polymerized film. Uh, the second case on the upper right is a two capsule system or multi capsule system where you might have a part A and a part B. So um, a Epoxide and say an amine would be an example of a, a two-part system. That's actually a pretty challenging system. Amines are pretty challenging to encapsulate, um, but that would just be an example of a multi-capsule system. Uh, then in the uh, lower left is a third example, which we call latent functionality. It's a single capsule system, but instead of having a, a capsule uh, or, a, excuse me, a, a second capsule or a catalyst that triggers the polymerization. Basically, what's in the capsule um, relies on some sort of latent functionality in the distributed through the matrix. And so some examples of what we've done here is capsule 1, uh, as shown here, might contain a solvent. And then the solvent might interact with some unreacted uh, epoxides to form uh, a film that's able to reheal the crack. And this is actually a very effective way of, of healing many, many polymers. Another example is that we might put a latent catalyst in the matrix like uh, an imidazole, and then what's in the capsule uh, would interact with that latent cat um, catalyst. So there's lots of different ways to look and use latent functionality as well. Then the, the fourth method um, is, is, is similar to the dual capsule system, but the idea is that you have one capsule and then a second um, reactive material is phase separated out uh, into the uh, polymer. And I'll give some examples of how we use this in, in coatings uh, where we um, actually phase separated out a PDMS material in epoxy and then the, we had a single catalyst-based uh, uh, capsule to um, initiate polymerization. So that's just a, a summary of the different types of um, systems you can, uh, or types of chemistries you can approach using capsules. So as I mentioned, uh, I was going to give an example of just uh, uh, some self-healing coating work that we did using uh, microencapsulated healing agents. And the idea, you see the, the schematic there. The capsules look very large in the schematic, but in, in reality, they would be quite small. We would use capsules on the order of 10 to 20 microns to accomplish this. But um, microencapsulated healing agents are first dispersed in the coating. And then the idea is that when the coating is damaged by scratch or abrasion, the capsules are ruptured. Um, once they are ruptured, the healing agents are whipped into the crack plane um, to the site of damage, and they mix and begin to react. And then the last stage, of course, is that there is polymerization at ambient conditions to reform the coating. 
and basically we effectively isolate the um, metallic substrate from the, any environmental uh, attack after that. Right, so one of the, the systems that we've studied and has been quite uh, successful um, is, the, is a PDMS healing chemistry. Um, we chose PDMS as the healing chemistry, which of course is different than the coating material. The coating materials are going to be uh, epoxy or polyurethane based, but the healing chemistry, this one is particularly nice because it will cure in the presence of both moisture and oxygen, um, which is important in, the, in a coating service environment. And so you see the different uh, components of, of this um, uh, PDMS healing system here uh, on the slide, where we have the, um, the HO PDMS, uh, which is encapsulated directly with the um, PDES and then the uh, DBTL component as well to form the uh, by condensation reaction. So we've looked at this in terms of both the single and a dual capsule systems. And I, I mentioned this a little bit earlier when I was talking about the different types of capsule systems. So if we have a, in the one capsule system, basically what we do is phase separate out components of the PDMS, um, the HO PDMS and the PDES, in, as liquid droplets in the coating. And then we encapsulate uh, the catalyst in uh, a core shell microcapsule where it has, a, uh, in this case, the microcapsule shell wall is a polyurethane uh, shell wall. And so in this case, the, the solvent is uh, dichlorobenzene, and the catalyst is dissolved in there. There's also a, a second way that we did this, where we encapsulated both components. So we have um, the PDMS components in a um, urea formaldehyde shell wall, and then uh, the catalyst in a separate capsule. And so that would be an example of the dual capsule systems. And let me just show you some, some types of data from this. Uh, this shows, uh, in this case, the coating is a epoxy vinyl ester material. And this is the single capsule system where the PDMS components are phase separated. And then we've got um, three weight percent microcapsules in there. The coating is scratched, and then um, after waiting 24 hours, it's healed and then subjected to this um, corrosion test, which in this case was just submersion in salt water. And then you see various controls and the, compared against the self-healing along the bottom. So, um, and here I, I should explain this. The matrix um, is just the control on the far left is just the vinyl ester matrix plus an adhesion promoter. So AP is adhesion promoter to make it stick to the substrate well. Um, and so you can see uh, lots of, uh, of corrosion and undercutting starting in that control. The second control just shows the matrix plus the catalyst microcapsules. And so once again, you see lots of corrosion starting in the scratched region um, because you're missing the second component. Then the third control is just the phase separated PDMS and no catalyst. Uh, so again, corrosion starting. And then the fourth over here is the full self-healing system where you have both um, the PDMS phase separated as well as the capsules, um, and you can see that the corrosion uh, after, under these conditions has been significantly delayed. And let me just show you a, a SEM image of the control sample. You can see where the scratch is, and really you, you see basically bare substrate that's starting to corrode down in the crevice. And then if you compare that to the self-healed sample, you can see what's going on here is that once you've scratched it, new material has actually polymerized and formed. This is the polymerized PDMS um, in the crack plane, which is what's effectively preventing or delaying that corrosion process. We've also demonstrated a similar result for the dual capsule system. So in this case, both the PDMS components are in microcapsules as well as the catalyst component. Um, conditions are, are the same, and you see basically that corrosion, again, is inhibited. 
So that's a nice success story in terms of how uh, micro-based, uh, microcapsule-based uh, self-healing works in a coating. We've looked at this in lots of different materials in terms of um, uh, bulk polymers as well as composites. Uh, also, let me let me just put into in addition to the visuals, we did some electrochemical testing that looks at the uh, corrosion current in a self-healing material versus, say, a, a control sample, and comparing a scratched versus an unscratched region. So again, just another data point um, showing the delay of or the onset of corrosion uh, in a electrochemical cell. So. We've done a lot of work with healing in looking at a little bit in coatings, a lot in bulk polymers, adhesives, as well as composites. Um, and uh, there's, there's some interesting questions to, to think about, though, about um, biologically inspired functions that are essentially what I like to call it beyond self-healing. Right? And I, I just have a list of, of different things our, our group is thinking about and looking into in terms of, uh, of functions beyond self-healing. Um, and one of the first uh, ones uh, that, that sort of goes hand in hand with healing um, and is a question that often came up is, can you just detect the damage or even detect if it's healed, right? And so damage detection has a lot of importance even beyond healing in this ability to do self-reporting, to know that it was damaged, um, maybe even just due to manufacturing or installation. Um, we've also been looking at more self-protecting systems to be used in, maybe in combination with healing, so anti-corrosion and anti-fouling that work in the same method of autonomous delivery. As I mentioned at the very beginning, we've also looked at, at the notion of thermal regulation, self-healing, and self uh, rather self-cooling and heating sort of to maintain uh, homeostasis in, in effect for the material, keep it at the same temperature. We've looked at or thinking about electrical restoration and reconfiguration, as well as uh, this bottom one is a big one, uh, which I won't get to talk too much about today, but the, this notion of biologically inspired regeneration and remodeling. Can a material actually regenerate lost mass? Can you remodel a material much like bone so that you always have a, a new material in your structure? So there's, there's lots of uh, big ideas that we can generate. But um, for, the, for the second half of this webinar, I'm just going to focus in on the, the damage detection part. Um, and this has been really a nice success story out of our um, uh, ICAM project. And it, it's just one portion of what we're working on, but it makes a nice story, so I thought I would um, describe uh, this recent work in autonomous damage indication. Um, I'd like to give a shout out to uh, the postdoc that's been working on this and leading this effort, which is Dr. Wenla Lee. He's here in the, my mini audience with me here at UIUC today. And then also the work of um, graduate student Chris Matthews, uh, for those of you at Manchester, you'll remember Chris as the excellent bowler. Um, and Chris has now uh, graduated and has, has gone on to work um, in actually in a composites company on the, in Rhode Island here in the U.S. So just a little bit of, of motivation. I don't think it needs too much motivation, but we know that um, many polymeric materials, coatings, composites are subject to small-scale damage, this damage is often really hard to detect under service conditions. And you see just an example of this, and of course it's a slide, so I'm cheating a little bit, but you, it's very difficult to see the scratch under certain optical conditions, um, as you see in the larger, uh, more magnified, uh, or less magnified image. And then, of course, when you zoom in, there is most definitely a scratch there. Um, and it would be nice to have a, a method of detecting these cracks before they become a problem um, so that maybe you could quickly repaint or um, repair that region where the cracks are even before a healing reaction or um, it goes into, uh, takes place or that it even goes into service. Um, we looked at two strategies for accomplishing damage indication. I'll talk about 
a, a strategy that involves a color change, right? So that was the first idea. Um, and then second, I'll talk about a strategy that involves a, a damage-induced fluorescence. So the, the idea is, is simple, that we have, um, we use our microcapsule-based systems. Uh, we're going to use coarse shell microcapsules that contain a indicating agent. Um, and the idea is, it, it actually, it sounds simple, but it's, it's quite complex to achieve in, in process because the capsules have to stay neutral. They um, basically have to be in an off state throughout much of the life of the coating. And then basically when damage occurs, they have to turn on so that you see this color. And you don't really want a system that gives you false positives or creates a murky color in your coating to begin with. And then once they turn on, they need to have good contrast and stability so that they stay on so that they can be observed um, uh, in a timely fashion. And so the idea, though, is that the mechanical damage is what releases um, the indicating agent and creates the, the uh, color change or turn on fluorescence. So I'll talk about the color change first. And the indicator uh, that we came upon was dichlorofluorescein, which is DCF for short. And you see it here in its liquid form. And the idea is that we basically dissolve DCF in EPA. EPA is a nice solvent for us because it's environmentally friendly, as well as um, it's, it's fairly easy to encapsulate. It has a high, very high boiling point. Um, but then when you add a small amount of amine uh, to this system, you see that it precipitates out a very uh, bright product that's a reddish-orange color. Um, and then in the, in the bottom frame, you can see the change in the uh, absorbance uh, where it starts out, at, again, as this light yellow and then changes to this opaque red solution just after the addition of a small amount of amines. So the challenge then was to encapsulate this uh, damage indicating agent. Um, and we encapsulated it in a, uh, a double shell wall capsule, which was uh, a, a polyurethane uh, urea formaldehyde. Um, and what you see are some, some really nice images of the microcapsules here. So these are DCF filled microcapsules. They're just, they're not in a coating yet here on the top. Um, and then you can see them after they've ruptured. This is the indicating agent, just a beautiful SEM image of that. And you get a, a real sense of this core shell morphology of the capsules. Then um, if we take those capsules and immerse them in a, uh, uh, a liquid amine and then uh, uh, damage them again, what you see are just the damaged capsules um, show this color indication. So you're kind of looking at a um, uh, down on the capsules and the color change there in, the, in an optical uh, image. And then notice that the capsules that are not ruptured still remain stable, even though they're, they're immersed in the liquid amine at this point. Okay. And then the, this next slide shows how this performs in a, a coating. Uh, this is a clear epoxy coating on steel, all right, and you see the control is on the left, all right. These are just microcapsules with EPA solvent in the coating. Um, you see the scratch there. It's actually a little difficult to see, but we've indicated it on the slide. And obviously, if there's no um, DCF in the capsules, you don't get any indicating mechanism. Then on the right, when there is DCF in the capsules, you see this this really brilliant orange slash red color uh, that appears. Um, and then this is, this is one of one of those favorite things to do is, is scribe letters into coatings. Uh, in this case, you see the Illinois logo. This is just a, a, an epoxy coating that's on a clear glass slide. Um, we looked at a lot of different variables on the effect of, um, the effect of a lot of different variables on this uh, damage indication mechanism. Um, for example, in this slide, we look at the effect of the depth of the scratch, so controlling um, or, or really looking at how small a scratch can we indicate. Um, and it turns out that we can indicate right down to about 10 microns or so um, using this method. 
and you can see as you go from left to right, the, the scratch is getting deeper, and of course the indication color is also getting more vibrant as we go. We also looked at the effect of con capsule concentration, the idea being to minimize, to identify the minimum concentration for visual indication. And so you can see, again, um, the effect of decreasing the co capsule concentration, as you might expect, also decreases the color intensity. But even with just a 5 weight percent loading of capsules, we're still getting a good indication mechanism. Then, uh, finally, what we see here, too, is the performance of uh, this damage indicating system in a commercial epoxy primer. Um, this is, so this is a gray uh, primer that is on um, a steel substrate. And basically, uh, what you see, in this case, I sort of switched the, the control and, and the active sample. But the control is on the right. There's a scratch, and then there's a stamp that's basically been um, uh, hammered into the, into the coating. And you can sort of see the, the damage there, but it, again, depending on the optical di conditions, it's not obvious. But in the, uh, in the coating where there are the um, DCF microcapsules, you have a clear indication of the scratch and that this impact occurred, uh, also damaging the, the coating. So, uh, the indicating system is also quite promising for you know, commercial coatings and paints. Now, you may have noticed that the, the indication system relies on the fact that there are residual amines in the coating. And, and in every epoxy coating that we tested and that's, that's cured up at, relatively, at room temperature or relatively low temperatures, there is always excess amine to trigger this reaction. In if we want to look at coatings that are not epoxy-based coatings, one strategy was to say, for example, this shows a PDMS coating. We can actually have our color indicating capsules, so the DCF capsules combined, just with amine capsules as well. And so in this case, the amine in the capsules is what triggers the color changing reaction, as you see over here on the left. And of course, in a PDMS coating where there are no residual amines, even with the color indicating capsules, there's no, there's no color change as, as we expected. So this gives us a, a pathway to look at non-epoxy-based coatings using this color changing method or indicating damage um, with the DCF. Um, it also indicates that we can, since we're using amine-based capsules here, that we can combine our damage indication with our self-healing strategies that I, that I talked about earlier. Right. So the, the last few slides that I'll talk about here are the second strategy for damage indication. And this is a, instead of using a color change, we're using a fluorescence. And from the very beginning, we kind of looked at this dual approach. Um, this damage-induced fluorescence uh, is uh, in collaboration with um, a Beckman fellow, uh, Dr. Max Robb, and in addition to Wenla and Chris Matthews. And this uh, paper just appeared on, online just a few days ago. So I've got the reference there and just the DOI number. So it's easy to access on, online from um, ACS Central Science. It's a new kind of high impact journal. And let me tell you a little bit about the mechanism for this damage-induced fluorescence. It's based on the concept of an aggregated induced emission, or AIE for short. And the AIE lumogen that we've been investigating, you see there, is uh, I'll just call it TPE for short. And the idea is that same process that mechanical damage causes the microcapsules to rupture and release their payload, but when the, before the capsules are ruptured, the TPE the, is in solution, um, it's in a liquid form, and you don't have any fluorescence. Then after it's damaged, the um, solvent in the capsules is allowed to evaporate, and you have the TPE in its solid form, so it's more compact. As soon as it's compact, you have this compacted, you have this aggregated induced emission phenomenon. Um, and what you see schematically here is 
fluorescence in, uh, induced by the damaged region. So just a little, um, again, just showing quantitatively the, the AIE behavior, this aggregation-induced emission um, of the TPE solution. So again, this is TPE in a uh, EPA, or actually in a hexyl acetate solution. Um, when it's in its solution form, we have no fluorescence. As soon as the solvent evaporates, and you can sort of see this visually on the, the bottom as the solvent evaporates, we start to see this very bright um, blue color where it's fluorescing at 450 nanometers. And again, you see that quantitatively up here uh, in the graph. Again, we, we did some characterization of just the microcapsules before they were in the uh, before they're embedded in a coating. And so here, uh, these are some interesting images. They take a little bit to absorb. But you see these different capsules under white light. And there are a total of five capsules. Two of the capsules have been damaged. And then the three capsules in the center are intact. And then when you, ex so they all, they all look kind of the same in white light. You can kind of see the damaged regions here. Then when you um, expose them to UV light and um, incite the fluorescence, uh, you can see that the intact capsules, which have the TPE still in solution, are not visible. And only the damaged capsules are visible. And you see that brilliant blue color. Uh, also, if you look at the damaged capsule uh, shell wall, you can see evidence of this uh, TPE deposits uh, on, the, on the surface of the capsule, which is also quite interesting. Then if we want to look at how this works in coatings, uh, again, we can see how the, um, some examples of the damage indication on the left is what the scratch looks like under white light conditions. Again, visible under fairly high magnifications. But then when it's under UV conditions, we see this really bright blue uh, fluorescence. Um, if we look at SEM images of the coating, what's also interesting is, once again, we see this evidence of uh, the TPE um, uh, solid uh, deposits forming uh, near the crack plane. Um, and also, we can look at, um, again, this fluorescence as a function of time after damage. And you can see, basically, in just a few minutes, it comes up and reaches its uh, as solvent evaporates, it reaches its full um, peak fluorescence intensity. For controls that contain uh, no TPE, just the solvent, really nothing is, is happening. Uh, once again, we looked at the effect of scratch depth, so a similar type of story, is if, story as before. If we slowly increase the depth of the crack, we see lots of fluorescence. Um, but we can go down to uh, crack widths of about 10 microns um, and get good visualization, even for, for fairly small cracks using this technique. Um, we can look at the effect of TPE concentration inside of the capsules, as well as the concentration of microcapsules in the coating. Um, and as you might expect, um, with higher concentrations of TPE in the microcapsule core, we get higher, um, more, uh, more higher intensity of the fluorescence. And likewise, as we increase the microcapsule loading in the capsules, we get greater fluorescence. But in this case, we're even getting nice detection. Um, even with as few as 2.5 weight percent capsules, we're getting some indicating mechanisms. And then also with five weight percent, we get good intensity as well. We also, for both systems, I didn't actually talk about this much for the DCF, the color changing system, but actually both systems have excellent stability uh, with time. Right? And so what you see here just visually is a uh, fresh scratch, meaning the scratch was just, the, the image was taken just after the the scratch was made, and it was made in a coating that was um, just cured up, just, just prepared. Then you see a new scratch in a coating that's been aged um, 
for a, a set amount of time. And then in the uh, uh, other case, you see that the, an old scratch that's been, that was created uh, and then also in an old coating. And you see that there's very little change in the average intensity between these different materials. So that it's telling us that this fluorescence it, using this aggregate, aggregation induced emission process is very stable. It doesn't bleach out um, like other forms of fluorescence, um, other methods of generating fluorescence. The other interesting thing about this fluorescent-based technique is that it works in a, in a wide range of coatings. So we've been showing it in epoxy-based coatings, but it works in uh, PDMS, in uh, polyacrylic, uh, UV-cured epoxy, polystyrene, um, lots of different types of coatings, and we get the same type of, of fluorescent-based uh, response when we um, expose it to UV. We also use this fluorescent technique to look at indication of damage in composites. And I think this is a pretty exciting area as well. So what you see uh, is an impacted uh, woven composite. Um, these are the real images. Uh, it's a little confusing sometimes to look at these images because you see the, the effect of the weave. Um, and this is the front impact surface. That damage is pretty. Um, there's a good ability to see it, but then on the back side, it's a little trickier to observe that damage. But when you use these um, uh, TPE-based microcapsules, again, it really shows up quite clearly where the composite has been impacted, even on the, the back side um, of the material. So with that, I'll, I'll just summarize that um, the first part of the talk, I just um, discuss some of the ideas we have about um, in imparting um, biologically inspired functions to polymers, the different approaches, and for this talk, of course, focused in on the microcapsule-based approaches, gave you an example of some healing work, but then described um, in more detail this newer uh, results on damage indication using both an in-situ color change with a DCF-based color indicator and uh, indication by fluorescence, which works on aggregate, aggregation induced emission of TPE. And um, as you might suspect, we are working on combining our healing and damage indication systems so that we can have, we can indicate damage, it's one color that it's damaged, and then a second color that might tell you it has healed.